så får vi nämligen ett öppningsföredrag som sätter hela scenen för hela konferensen. And uh, now I will switch to English so that Carlotta can uh, understand me because we are now uh, have, having a keynote presentation by Carlotta Perez. Hello Carlotta. Hi. Wow. And it's so great to have you here. And uh, actually, folks, the inspiration from Carlota set the topic for the full conference. I was so inspired listening to her. And when I was asked to take a lead on the conference program, I was not in doubt. We build it around digital transformation. And um, I will just give you a little presentation so you know Wow, how lucky we are to have her here. So Carlota is a British Venezuelan researcher specialized in the social and, social and economic impact of technical change. She is honorary professor at the University College of London, the University of Sussex, the Tallinn University of Technology, and she's also in the EU Commission's Experts Group for Green Growth. So you, she used to speak at EU level. What is special about Carlota Perez is that she provides a message of hope in this turbulent time. Do we need that? And her hope is actually grounded in many, many years of research, looking at technology revolutions from the start of the industrial, from the industrial revolution and until today. And she has revealed some important patterns. Now she encourages us to use the learning from the past when we actively shape the future. And by Forbes ma magazine, Dr. Perez is described as one of five economists redefining everything. And I think that was what she did for me. I recognize this because I used to work as a DevOps trainer, and then I asked myself, why should we really teach the, all these organizations the secret of high-speed IT? Aren't we producing far too much, too fast already? And then I learned that in the time we are in now, we really need to take this digital revolution uh, seriously and use it for the best of humanity and the best of future. And that is our task. So, folks, time to wake up. Welcome, Carlota Perez. I'm so delighted you are here at us. Give her a big applause. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. So uh, I have been working for a very long time studying technological revolutions. So what I'm going to share with you today is about the issue of shaping the digital revolution towards smart, green, fair, and global growth, which is sort of the best direction we could do it in. But I want to warn you that I'm not going to talk about technology. I'm going to talk about the shaping. I'm going to talk about politics and policy. I'm going to talk about what businesses should do, what governments should do, what people should do, what we all should do in order to shape this revolution and make the best of it. So uh, I want to begin by saying something very simple and very obvious, which is that successful businesses and societies are those that do today what will be best for tomorrow. 
and requires recognizing the nature of both today and tomorrow. We need to examine historical regularities in order to understand technological revolutions and recognize the role of markets and governments in their patterns of diffusion. We are currently facing several challenging questions. Will robotics and artificial intelligence eliminate most jobs? Are environmental policies an obstacle to growth? Is growth an obstacle to environmental sustainability? Can the current level of inequality be overcome? Are markets or states or both the best guarantee of progress? Will we make the green transition on time? Well, quite a set of questions. I imagine most of you have at least some of those questions at the center of your worries. Well, I suggest that history may have the answers. And that's what I've been trying to do for many years with my research on technological revolutions. So I will begin by talking about the five technological revolutions, four golden ages, how can we unleash a golden age now? The role of government in providing direction for synergy. And finally, something very important, which is the role of lifestyle changes in paradigm transitions. In market economies, the space of the technologically feasible experiences a major leap every 40 to 60 years. So we have one revolution and then another revolution comes it makes a lot of difference in some places, but it also modernizes and changes what was there before. And then the third revolution picks up on that one and on the previous one and so on. So we have major changes and each successive revolution opens new innovation spaces and upgrades much of the previous ones. So let's look at the five technological revolutions in the past 250 years. The first one, of course, in Britain, the Industrial Revolution, beginning at the end of the 18th century with machines, factories, and canals. We can think of canals as the internet of the time. It was as important for them as internet has been for us. Uh, from 1830, Britain, age of steam, coal, iron, and railways. That's, that was the age of the iron railways. Then we come to the age of steel, where the railways become steel steel and heavy engineering from 1870. And there it was not just Britain, USA and Germany were vying for leadership and they actually overtook Britain. Uh, it was the age of electrical, chemical, civil and naval engineering. And it was the first globalization. That is when the Southern hemisphere got incorporated into the world economy. Then in 1913 with Ford's Model T, we had the beginning in the US, which became the leader at the time, of the age of the automobile, oil, petrochemicals, and mass production. That is the one we're trying to overcome now. We're trying to, to go beyond this mass production revolution with what is now the current age of information technology and telecommunications also began in the USA with, uh, with Intel's microprocessor in 1971. So we've been in it for quite a long time and it's taking great effort to overcome the problems that mass production created after having created a very good life for many, many, many people. So what I'm holding is that we're only halfway along the ICT revolution. We still have all the best times to come ahead. And what will happen afterwards? Well, sometime this century, somewhere, USA, Europe, China, both others, somewhere, uh, the age of biotech, bioelectronics, nanotech, and new materials. Why, why can I say that? Well, studying revolutions, you notice that every one of them has been around being shaped by the current revolution, but already in gestation, the things that will come together when one revolution matures and needs to be replaced. And that is when revolutions happen, when the need for replacement comes because of no more uh, increases in productivity, no more market expansion, no more advances in products or whatever, then, then there is this search and the things that are already there get come together. 
But we are now halfway along this one, and we need to shape the future. Each of these drives a great surge of development. Many countries come up, many in new industries, many new people, a whole layer of people becomes better off, propagating for 40 to 60 years or more, and radically changing the prevailing paradigm of the time. Indeed, each new paradigm brings a deep transformation, a new way of producing, a new way of working, a new way of traveling and communicating, and a new way of living. The whole constitutes a completely different paradigm. The paradigm shift driven by the new information and communications technologies is actually going from cheap oil and materials for mass production to cheap microelectronics and information for flexible, mostly intangible production. So we go from scale and identical products to variety, quality, adaptability, customization. It's a very different thing from everybody the same to trying to adapt to all the different circumstances which information technology allows. We went from going from turning services into products to turning products into services or products plus services. Uh, we have already seen the streaming of music, of film, of books, of news. All those things are now uh, services rather than, and of course, we could have rental and sharing rather than selling and so on. Closed pyramids, now open networks. Nobody would think of creating one of these command and control pyramids now. It's mainly networks. From stable routines to continuous improvement, which means that we go from seeing people as human resources like raw materials to seeing people as human capital because they are creators of value in a very obvious way. From fixed plans, five-year plans, two-year plans, five-year plans, to flexible strategies, which actually change with circumstances. From three-tier markets, big, medium, small, expensive, medium, cheap, and so on, to highly segmented and customized markets. From the disregard for the environment to the environment as guide to innovation from planned obsolescence and waste to circular economy and maintenance, and from internationalization, trade between nations, to globalization. But beware, globalization is not about the disappearance of the national state. Not only that, government now will probably be national, supranational, subnational, regional, municipal, etc. It's a multi-level government, and it is those institutions that shape the space so that the globalized economy can choose where to put different things. But it's because local and regional and national and supranational governments shape the space in which those that global economy will, uh, will uh, locate itself. Okay, so such a major change in common sense is not easy. So the diffusion process breaks into two widely different periods. First, we have the installation period for about 20 or 30 years, and then we have the deployment period. And in between, there is what I call a turning point, basically recession or recessions. So the technological revolution goes from very slow development to much faster all the way to maturity when it starts stalling. But it begins with a turbulent and unequal creative destruction period because the previous revolution is still there. The new revolution is happening in a space that had been shaped by the previous revolution. So we go to this period of creative destruction where the new tries to get rid of the old and create all the new things. It's a time of new jobs and lost jobs and skills with the rise and decline of industries and regions. It's a time when finance reigns, forcing business to learn the new paradigm. And it ends in financial bubbles, crashes, and new giants emerge. So the new giants are created in this turbulent period, and then they will be the central part of the deployment period. But in between, we have a difficult period of instability and uncertainty, social unrest, 
resentment and populism. It's the time we're living now. And then comes the golden age, the time of creative construction where everything goes together rather than destroying in order to bring the new, every bit of new actually constructs the new, uh, the new economy and the new social space. It's a time for a proactive, a proactive state to set a win-win game between business and society. And then we have already the next revolution in gestation. But at this time, finance recouples with production. That's what had been happening because during the turning point, finance decouples from production completely and becomes just a, a separate financial game in the air, which does not. And this time it's worse because this time it's global. So it can actually escape national regulation by going to another country. So what happens in the golden age is that finance starts actually serving production again. And there would be new jobs and skills in new areas of high and of low productivity. I will explain that, that not everything uh, comes to very high productivity. Not everything will be robotics and artificial intelligence. There will be a lot of personal jobs. So what I hold is that we might be here we might actually have the golden age ahead. It depends on us, of course, but it is the time for it to happen. So if we look at the historical record, we see bubble prosperities, recessions, and golden ages. We see the Gilded Age bubbles, which look like prosperity with technological revolution and growing inequality, but lots of people becoming millionaires. Then we have the post-bubble recession, political unrest on populism. And finally, the golden age prosperity, institutional revolution, win-win game, et cetera. It is the good times. So the first one was the canal mania, followed by the Great British Leap. The railway mania was followed by the Victorian boom. The many global booms of the Gilded Age, so all through the Southern Hemisphere, we had Argentina, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, all the those countries incorporated, and of course also Canada, and U.S. and uh, in the in the north. Then after that, we have the Belle Epoque in Europe and the Progressive Era in the U.S. After the Roaring Twenties and the Thirties, the recessions and the war, we had the post-war Golden Age, and this time the dot-com boom in 2000, the global casino in 2008, and all these other things that have been happening, of course, not, not necessarily regular like the COVID and, and the current war and so on. Wars are very typical at this time when there is so much tension both within nations and between nations. And then we get the sustainable global ICT golden age, will we? That's the question. This is what this presentation is about. Is it possible to have this global sustainable golden age? And again, I hold that it's very likely that we are here. The golden ages have resulted from a major policy redesign that provides directionality and leads to overall productivity growth and a more balanced society. So it is really the good times, the good times for everybody rather than just for the few. Uh, in order to have a sense of what that means, I want to show you the very well-known Piketty and size graph on changing U.S. inequality in the 20th century with mass production, of course. It clearly pictures the process. This is it. We have the, the two world wars, the 1930s, the 1920s bubble. This is the installation period of mass production. Then we have the post-war boom, the golden age of mass production, and then the installation of the next and the two bubbles that we have already had. Now, this is the percent of income of the top 1% of taxpayers in the U.S. from 1913 to 2010. Well, 25% for the top 1%, 25% of income of declared, of course, in the U.S., you're not sure that they're declaring all their income, but it's still 25% of declared income across the, and we get again, 25% of declared income. But what happens here, that they only get 10%. Of course, 10% of a bigger pie, and also 10% supposedly to invest. And it so happens 
that in this time, it is more likely that it will be investment in the real economy, whereas here there is a lot of investment in just the financial economy. It's like a casino where money makes money and there is this inflation, bubble inflation of in the financial market only, which makes people with assets richer than people with incomes because this differential asset, this differential inflation makes the financial world richer. So we're trying to get to a golden age where there will be more real investment and more equality. And my research shows that the social pendulum swings regularly. Otherwise we would never have been able to come from the satanic mills of the 18th century to the workers of today that own a house and uh, a car at the door, electrical appliances, a good life and their children go to university. That is progress, but it's a ratcheting progress. It goes back and forth, back and forth each time, but each time it goes up further. It's a shame that we have to go through these tougher periods, but that's how the market economy works. So how can we unleash the golden age now? Let us first locate this moment in the regular historical sequence. We are not in the 1980s, which is when the free markets had to be brought in because maturity had set in. We are in a 1930s moment. So uh, after the post-war golden age, we were in the 1980s. We are now after the financial bubble collapses. So what was the context in the 1980s? Most industries were maturing. Persistent stagflation. Moved to third world for cheap inputs. Keynesian policies were impotent. Bureaucracy had turned into an obstacle. Industrial policies were failing and the IT revolution was just beginning. So we needed to get government out of the way and let finance take over. That's how the technological revolutions take off. But then of course that leads to financial bubble collapses and to inequality and all sorts of problems, which is where we are now. Great technological potential, haphazard innovation, idle money in a financial casino, very uneven productivity, underconsumption, because lots of people have too little, inequality, underemployment, insecurity, social unrest, anger, messianic leaders, autocrats, populists rising, war brewing, good almighty, all these things that are happening, but they are typical. They have happened. This is similar to what happened in the 1930s and similar to what happened in previous similar times in the, with, in the middle of each technological revolution. So production must take over now and governments must provide direction. But we're late. Why has this installation lasted so long? It should have, it should have ended with the 2008 crash, but partly it's due to uniqueness. We're replacing more mental than manual work. In fact, we had hardly ever replaced mental work. The infrastructure came 25 years later. Normally, the revolutions begin with the infrastructure. This time, in, uh, microelectronics and software and all that came before, and then internet came in the 90s. So that's 25 years after. And this one is global rather than national, so it takes longer to, to go through the whole process. But that's only partly. Partly, but more importantly, it's due to the social response. We have longer lives, so that delays the rise of the young. We have a new ceiling. We have a ceiling for women, and now we have a ceiling for the young that never get there, which is one of the reasons why they're escaping into the metaverse and all these things, because that's where they get a chance to innovate. Because in the regular world of business and of uh, government, they're not getting a chance. Too many old people are leading. But then we have something more important, that China gave a new lease of life to mass production. China, with very low cost labor, longer hours, and the possibility of very advanced infrastructure in which they invested, had created a paradise for mass production, which means that the old mass production model with all its waste and all its consumerism is still with us because China is producing all these things. Uh, I don't mean blame China. I mean, that's how they have... Uh, lifted their population up, but that's what has happened to lengthen this period. And perhaps most importantly, the, the troubled 
asset relief program, which was a trillion dollars going to finance and quantitative easing, helped finance become global and especially unruly. It is completely decoupled from the real economy and it's completely disconnected from state regulation. So coping with China and reining finance in are two essential tasks to unleash a global golden age. They are very, very difficult, I agree. And that's what makes it, that's my part of pessimism. But we must now change the context towards smart, green, fair, and global growth. With the institutional equivalent of Bretton Woods and the Marshall Plan. Bretton Woods was the institution that created this international uh, IMF, uh, the World Bank, and in a way later the UN, but in the same spirit, and the Marshall Plan, which was a, a huge amount of money being led to Europe to reconstruct after the war by the US. We need um, a far reaching change in the economic context towards green. So all the all the policies, all the, everything has to benefit. It has to become more profitable to invest in green than to invest in the old ways. And that's that's a policy question. It's a tax question, it's a subsidy question, all these things. A radically new consensus between business, government, and society. We all have to agree that we've got to go towards green and that we've got to go to reduce inequality. Massive private and public investment in converging directions. We will also only do it if we actually understand that that's the direction to go in order to create a golden age. Initiate the reversal of social inequality, both national and global. It's not possible to continue the way we are now. With on historically, we we are going back to the way things were a very long time ago. But that is how it's happened each time, unfortunately. What we need to build then is a positive sum game between business, society, and the planet, which can be unleashed for the benefit of all. And those directions are not only for humanita humanitarian reasons, even if you really are completely selfish and you don't care about the poor or about the, or about the global south or anything, it's for business. Why should it be smart? Because ICTs are the most powerful tools to innovate and increase productivity. So it's good for business. Why green? Because apart from being urgent, it offers a world of new opportunities for innovation and synergies. Why fair? Because peace and stability are only possible when all can expect a better future and because consumer demand depends on consumer incomes. And why global? Because full global development would create massive demand for capital goods, engineering, and other job creating exports from the North and would drastically reduce migrations. So all the problems business could have can be solved by smart, green, fair, and global growth. So it's intelligent for business to join the government and for government to lead the change. So what is the role of government in providing direction for synergy? Well, from technological viability to profitability and social progress is not so such an obvious move. The technologically feasible is infinitely greater than the socially acceptable, and that in turn is larger than the economically profitable. So the difference between the profitable and the socially acceptable is bridged by government policy. When, all the, when they say infrastructure, the government spends in infrastructure, why? Because it's not economically profitable, but it's technologically feasible and not only socially acceptable, but socially desirable and needed. So in many cases, even the whole, the whole renewable energy thing has been moved by government because it's not yet economically profitable. So there is, there is no technological determinism. It's not that things will happen because it's feasible. It's got to be, in the end, economically profitable, and it has to be socially acceptable. There are parts of the economically profitable that are not accepted by society, and society will fight, and governments will usually regulate. 
So we don't need to think that whatever can happen technologically will happen. Robotics and AI are not going to destroy all jobs. The ultimate direction of technology is a socio-economic and political issue. We are at the turning point when the new technologies are sufficiently developed and their paradigm and potential are sufficiently understood. It is time for governments to tilt the playing field. Technology only sets the stage. Then society engages in conflicts and compromises to give direction and define the social context for the future. The shaping is political. It's not just technological. It's not just economic. It's very political. So what is the nature of the turning point? That's also political. Now, as in the 1930s, structural unemployment or underemployment, de-skilling of many professions, hopelessness, resentment, inequality, casino finance, giant monopolies, feeble growth, talk of secular stagnation. By the way, the first time the term was ever used was in the 1930s by Alvin Hansen in a very similar situation. Recessions, even depression, <laughs> and also xenophobia, it can be the Jews, it can be the Muslims, it can be the Mexicans, it can be whoever, as it's the other. People want to blame the resentment, you know, who, who is to blame? So they blame the people near them, which might be, might, they feel they might be taking their jobs or taking their place in school or whatever. Economic migrations, because it's always a global phenomenon social unrest, and sometimes it's economic migrations within the country, from the countryside to the cities, for instance, when they were desperate uh, because, you know, the potato famine or things like that. Social unrest, political cleavages, all political parties divide, lots of new movements, movements emerge. It's a time, practically every party has been born in one of these times, because that's the time when people feel that the old parties are not responding. And of course, you have populist messianic leaders. And there I'm going to include Hitler and Stalin. They were both promising heaven. They were both talking. They were both in this idea that everything is wrong and I am the one who's going to solve everything. And they were all in hate, one of the Jews and whatever, and the other of the capitalists. And this and that situation of left and right populism has happened each time in every one of these turning point periods. But what happens is that the turning point also has a huge underlying technological potential capable of transforming the whole economy and bringing a golden age. But for it to happen, the state must shape and tilt the playing field. So the playing field can be even but tilted in the direction, in this case, of green. So when the economy has a direction, there is synergy and in innovation and investment and market benefit from positive externalities. In market economies, the direction is not arbitrary. It emerges from the main trends already in the market and the ones that fulfill expressed social needs. Of course, in autocratic regimes, it can respond to political goals. The mass production revolution was shaped differently by Hitler, Stalin, and the Western democracies. And growth results from the dynamic demand created by that direction, whichever it is. Suburbanization so and the Cold War as the direction given to the post-World War II Golden Age. The innovation enablers for mass production were cheap oil and materials, universal electricity, road and airway network. What was, where does the demand volume and profile trends come from? Welfare state, of course, the welfare state guaranteed that you had, uh, that everybody had enough. And basically that if you lost your job, you could continue your payments. The labor unions, which forced productivity increases to lead to wages, to wage increases. Public procurement, a lot of government purchases, in particular, of course, military demand, but also for infrastructure and various other things, and especially the credit system being spread to people. Before that, the credit system was only for business or, and of course, there were the lenders. And there is the other thing, which is extremely important, which is that it's a specific demand as direction for innovation. So suburbanization, 
everybody has a house, so you fill it with electrical appliances and you have a car at the door. So that is the creation of demand, what to put in the refrigerator and the fridge. This is a direction that, and of course, plastics for everything, throwing everything up, post-war reconstruction and the Cold War. So these two directions were the ones that government funded and suburbanization was the private sector and people becoming that. So the various elements, of course, were provided in different proportions in each first world countries, country and the developing world sort of stayed out of the game. They just sold raw materials, energy and bought uh, manufactured products. So how did those directions translate into converging policies? Well, you have national policies that create massive demand effects, significant income tax, progressive distribution of demand capacity for consumption and public expenditure. So the government had money to give, to redistribute. Unemployment insurance, social security, gave stability of the consumer credit system for homes and durable goods over recessions. Can you imagine if everybody returned their car and, their, and the key to their house every time there was a recession? Public services and defense, massive state employment, and state demand for mass and high-tech products. The massive investment in roads and other infrastructure enabled suburban home construction and ownership at affordable prices and demand for cars, appliances, et cetera. So the government created the space and business created the houses and the houses created the consumers. Mass education and health systems, basic cost covered by the state, freed for consumption, of course, so you didn't have to, so uh, also, the wages didn't have to cover education and health. It was a melting pot for homogeneous public sector demand. Then official labor unions, turning higher productivity into higher consumption, shorter working time, time for enjoying and for buying products and services, and farm subsidies, equalizing industrial and agricultural profits, market for mechanized equipment and petrochemicals, and internationally, the Marshall Plan, the World Bank, the IMF, the GATT, and the UN. Goodness, a major set of national and international institutional innovations to unleash the golden age. It's what we have to do now. We've got to do something as big as this. It's not, you don't get a golden age just by wishing a little bit of policy or saying you cannot buy cars that are not electric by 1930, by 2030. You know, we, we have a huge need for institutional innovation. So how can we unleash the global golden age of the ICT revolution? We count on cheap ICT, we could do full global development, and we can give the direction smart and green. Because revamping transport energy, energy products and product systems, production systems, to make them sustainable, is equivalent to post-war reconstruction and suburbanization. Imagine if we were to make every house uh, resistant, you know, well, well, in Britain, so I guess in Norway, every house is well protected against the cold. Incorporating successive millions across the world into sustainable consumption patterns is equivalent to the welfare state and government procurement in terms of demand creation, including capital goods and engineering. And full internet access at low cost is equivalent to electrification and suburbanization in facilitating demand and education. I'm making a parallel with what was done for the golden age before, because we have to understand that that golden age is over. We, we cannot do it by consumer demand in this wasteful way as we had before. So now let's look at the role of lifestyle changes in paradigm transitions. So the question of whether robotics and AI will lead to massive unemployment uh, is, is a valid question, but only because the progress in market economies is a very bumpy ride. Every installation period has brought a new potential for wealth creation, but by destroying jobs, skills, industries, and regions. So that leads to anger, resentment, and populism. And that, if we have a brilliant, leaders, political leaders, and if society pushes them, then golden age deployment can reset the playing field, create new jobs requiring other skills and changing the ranking of industries, regions, and countries. This is the pattern. 
So shifts in lifestyles play a crucial role in the creation of new employment. And all successful economies have a small, high productivity sector that supports the wealth of a much larger, lower productivity one. This is an important thing to understand because we do need AI and robotics. We're not going to say, no, 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 because it's going to destroy jobs. We need to create jobs across the whole economy and take advantage of the high productivity that these other technologies can bring in order to create more wealth, which can then allow proper salaries for service workers, for teachers, for everybody who that we need in the transformation. Each golden age enables a different lifestyle and creates new jobs. So if we have the industrial revolution, sorry, not the industrial, the second, the second revolution, the age of steam coal, and you know, the industrial revolution in England was between the French and the Napoleonic Wars. They were in war all the time. So in fact, the golden age was only, was a very peculiar golden age. So the urban Victorian living that came with the second revolution, of course, you had manufactured textiles and pottery, but you had handmade everything else with new jobs in crafts and services. You've probably seen it in the films about the British uh, Victorian age. Then in the first globalization, the third revolution, we have cosmopolitan living in the Belle Epoque, restaurants, hotels, uh, all the entertainment, theater, music halls, uh, lots of reading, posters, you know, there was a whole world that was basically uh, based on, on art and services. Industrial electricity, paint and materials, of course, lots of industrial things. Uh, then also bringing from all over the world carpets, objects of art and so on. That's what was consumed. The lifestyle included that. But the new jobs in services and entertainment were massive. And that's what happened at that time. And then we come to our suburban family living of the mass production revolution, where all products were manufactured, preferably plastic and electric. And there were, but there were new jobs in construction and services. So much so that while industry, manufacturing industry tripled its product, it only increased jobs by 30%. But everything else, including government, but also all the other services, uh, tripled work uh, jobs. So you get the jobs somewhere else, even if you have very high productivity in some sectors. But these lifestyles also change aspirations, culture, notions of community, and forms of leisure and entertainment. So they become strong shapers of demand, innovation, and investment. But the process is difficult, complex, and protracted. The emergence of the American way of life, I can show you. Uh, it was a paradigm shift from the 1910s, consolidated after, as a lifestyle after World War II. Of course, in the 10s, it was already in gestation. And by 1913, you already have the assembly line. And then it, it went very quickly. So what happened? People went from energy-scarce living, where energy is expensive and often inaccessible, to energy intensive homes and mobility where energy is cheap and its availability unlimited. We're not there that now. Okay, so we go from trains, horses, carriages, stagecoaches, ships, and bicycles to automobiles, buses, trucks, airplanes, and motorcycles. From local newspapers, posters, theaters, and parties to mass media, radio, movies, and television, especially television at home. Ice boxes and cold stoves, refrigerators, and central heating. Doing housework by hand, doing housework with electrical equipment. Natural materials, cotton, wool, leather, silk, to synthetic materials. Everything became plastic from paper, cardboard, wood, glass, and packaging. Preference for disposable plastics of all sorts. From fresh food bought daily from specialized suppliers, because of course you had to put it in the ice box on ice melted, to refrigerated, frozen, or preserved food bought in supermarkets, every week, every two weeks, even every month for some people. City or country living and working, and now we have suburban living separate from work. Of course, you also had cities, but. And all this was strongly aided by advertising business strategies and government policies. That's, that's what has to be done now too. The intrinsic characteristics of ICT are compatible with green. 
this is important because some people think they're not. Although ICT products adopted the planned obsolescence model of the previous paradigm, this is really bad. That because it happened at a time of cheap, when, when energy became cheap in the 90s, after having been very expensive in the 70s and 80s, they just became plant obsolescent. So we are changing our phones every, every year and changing our computers every year and so on. It's completely crazy. We shouldn't do that because all you need to do is change the software, especially now. But anyway, so we went from the logic of cheap energy for transport, electricity, synthetic materials to the logic of cheap innovation is processing, transmission, and productive use. So we can use information rather than energy to do all sorts of things. So we go from preference for tangible products and disposability on thinking use of energy and materials and unavoidable environmental destruction to preference for services and intangible value, a huge potential for savings in energy and materials and the potential for environmental friendliness. Paradigm shifts confront inertia and contingencies. They are turbulent and take time. They take time. So smart green sharing lifestyles could unleash a full employment golden age, an aspirational good life with less energy and materials, more ICT and more jobs, with human-centered services, health and care, leisure and sports, entertainment, mobility and distribution, diversified electricity, the arts, sharing, logistics, maintenance, resource recovery, recycling and reuse, pollution reduction, and so on. And on the other side, modernization of production, the circular economy, truly durable products, 3D printing, rental model, nanotech nanotechnology, and so on, to hydroponics and urban agriculture, and so on. Massive innovation and massive employment and sustainable activities enhanced and enabled by ICT while also using robotics and artificial intelligence. The shift to ICT green consumption patterns is possible, not by guilt and fear, but by desire and aspiration. This is super important for us to understand. If we just say you're guilty of having used too much energy, so therefore, or God, we're going to have this horrible thing coming up. It's very difficult for everybody to do it. But if this is the good life, then it's desire. You want it green. You want it to be smart. You want it. That's what's better. The other is disgusting. All this throwing things out. You, you have such bad taste. You should keep things. Things, old things are good. Things that last, that's better than things that have to be thrown out. So it's a cultural shift. So we need to shape and enable a change in our notions of luxury and the good life. But it must happen first and visibly in the advanced countries so that people across the world will want to copy it. <laughs> Sorry. So there is a major opportunity for the development of a European way of life and of production. So Europe could become the leading center of where things go and what things, what people want, what is better, what is desirable is a European product, just as the American way of life uh, did that in the past revolution. So, of course, part of the shift in lifestyles is already happening. Historically, the notions of luxury and good taste have always emerged at the top of the income ladder and uh, uh, and the top of the education scale, and they spread by imitation. So we already think that small is better than big, natural materials better than synthetic, multi-purpose better than single function, gourmet and organic food better than standard, minimalist design better than clutter, fresh organic fruit and vegetables are healthier, exercise is important for well-being, cycling is a good alternative to driving, working from home and not commuting is possible and preferable, solar power is luxurious and so are electric cars, Internet communication, shopping, learning, streaming, social media, and entertainment are better than the old ways, etc. But relative prices, policies, and wider interests have to follow, will they? Government policy and business strategies need to accelerate the shift in lifestyles. Mass production to ICT, go from products to services, from tangible to intangible, from possession to access, from passive to active, from plastic to natural, 
from processed to fresh, from identical to customized, from centralized to distributed networks and platforms, sustainable production and living must be made cheaper, more profitable, more accessible, and more desirable, and salaries made high enough to provide dynamic demand. What are possible measures for a fair global future for the information age? Universal basic income handled with artificial intelligence plus an ATM or even your phone and reimbursed as tax by everybody who doesn't need it. So we get rid of all the bureaucracy, all the things you just have it for everybody and most people return it. Only the ones that need it will keep it and they'll have it in their phone or somewhere. So it's really simple. Good wages for service workers that are essential for life as demand. Increase the prices of fossil fuels and materials. We must find a way, maybe with taxes, but maybe through some other means to encourage materials and energy saving and help fund development. And that means make it more expensive. Set a financial transactions tax for a Marshall Plan to fund development. Well, we need to encourage investment and an innovative sector in, in sustainable, adequate capital goods. Actually, if the global south does not go green, we all roast. There is no way that we're going to have a decent planet if we don't if we don't do the whole planet green. And the South just doesn't have the money to do it. So a financial transactions tax can fund, especially global financial transactions. Promote a rental system for all appliances, which should last a hundred years, and that should be obligatory that things put their spare parts on the web so you can 3D printing. It would create thousands of maintenance jobs. Uh, we would 3D print parts and updates and a recycling at the end and so on. So many things we have to, our imagination has to stretch, 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 huge, bold programs to make the changes. Is this utopian or realistic? It sounded utopian to say in mid 1930s depression, that blue collar workers should have lifetime jobs and fully equipped suburban houses with a car at the door. Ha, 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 are you crazy? Well, it turned out to be realistic. Increasing wages created many more millions of consumers for mass production and sustained growth. Or somebody saying colonies should gain independence. Ha, 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 you're crazy. That's not gonna happen. Well, it did. And the rising middle classes in the developing world adopted the American way of life, widening world market for mass production. So it was a win-win game in both cases. Or if somebody in the late 1960s had said that some of the values of the hippie movement back to natural materials, organic food, etc., should become normal and seen as more luxurious. Aha, well, they did. Innovation in natural textile fibers have transformed the world of fashion and innovation in distribution logistics have made organic foods the premium, more expensive segment in supermarkets. So there you are. They were not utopian, those things. So shifts in consumption patterns shift profit-making opportunities. And in times of paradigm shift, it's safer to be bold than to be realistic. In market economies, Society shapes and is shaped by technology. Understanding and using its potential for shaping a meaningful, sustainable future is the challenge of this generation. Thank you. Carlota, thank you so much. You are uh, setting really the digital trans, uh, uh, transition we are going through in a perspective. Uh, I brought with me Niklas here because uh, we thought we had uh, time for some questions, but if, uh, Niklas, I think we need to do it very short now. Can you answer short as well, uh, Carlota? <laughs> so, do you have any questions? For her, Nicholas. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's uh, extremely interesting uh, times we are living in, and all of us wants to create a better world. But it can feel quite overwhelming when we talk about the global economy, and 
we talk about the different nations and different unions and so on, but what would you say? Um, I mean, I think we all can argue that a revolution doesn't happen when one entity is doing a lot. It is when uh, many entities that do small things all the time. So if we want to do small things all the time as individuals, what shall we do? <laughs> there are so many things. It depends what you are. If you are a potential entrepreneur, you can start thinking of the direction in which you should, you should find things to do, what you will invest in. If you are a scientist, you could find, you do things that have to do with solving both the, especially the climate change issue. If you are a government agent, a government servant in some way, depending on where you are, you try to get policies that go in the direction, in, in these directions that are the ones that could create a golden age. Uh, you might make sure that there are municipal, there is enough municipal power so that local governments can, can think ahead and do important changes, create changes and policies and invest mm -hmm. locally. It depends who you are. I mean, the whole thing is to understand where we're going. Once you know where you're going, then each person does uh, whatever they can within their space or mm -hmm. they organize in NGOs or they do whatever. There are so many, so many things that can be done depending on where you're placed. Mm -hmm. and just, it, it's a just... question of knowing the direction. Thanks. Once you need, once you know, you know, something very important that I didn't refer to in the presentation, which I think is, is crucial, is that the young are now dedicated to entertainment. They're all doing uh, computer games and they're doing all these things that are, or, or crypto or escape, you know, they're escaping to the metaverse because this world is not giving them the opportunity to innovate. So we need to find ways of getting the young to come back into the real world and start looking for innovations that will solve real problems. All the problems that we have, we have problems all over in education, in, so, in, um, so, in every single space, yeah. in, in nutrition, in everything. And the young are in the metaverse. Let's bring them back from the metaverse. We need wow. them here. That's great. <laughs> And actually, I think that the generation, the young ones, are also extremely motivated to, to do the green shift. And uh, so that's uh, something we should bring with us. And all the companies here, of course, we all should not wait for the politicians and governance. We should just focus on this kind of uh, new future that we really want and shape it. Carlota, we will send you a gift, <laughs> and it's an English book. So, and that is about all the best practice within digital transition and fast IT and how we work. So, thank you. it will come to you, and thank you so much for. Thank you, me. thank you for inviting me, and I'm sorry for all the technical glitches that took away the time for the questions.